Today, I'm going to try to summarize a lot about confocal microscopes in a kind of a simple way, I hope, although we'll see how it goes. And then talk a little bit for the rest of the time about the history of the development of this instrument. Once again, it's, it's kind of interesting in that it emerged in a certain way, way before it was necessary and way before it could be really adapted to modern research as it has been now. And as you know, the confocal is for almost any laboratory, the only kind of microscope that people want to use. So what I want to do then is go through a little bit about why there should be such an interest now in confocal microscopy and a little bit about how these things work and how it gets put together. And then uh, there really are some very interesting bits of history that I want to go through. So that's basically the shape of today's talk. The problem that one starts with as a microscopist is that if you're looking at a sample that has any thickness to it at all, so I'm going to show you, here's a sort of a glass slide, and here's a section or a piece of tissue sitting on that slide. And you're interested in the structures that are hidden or within that section. Some of the structures, of course, depending on how thick the section is, some of the structures will be big enough that you can see them through the section. That is that they're, they'll be exposed by cutting through the section. Other material may be just sort of hidden within the section in one way or another. Most of it is surrounded by other material. So remember that you may have a structure here, but there will be other material various sorts surrounding this tissue. So now when you look down upon this, what you would see, if you just look at even this, the sample that I drew is having this, if you now look straight down on it, you'll see its profile, but you'll also see that that profile is sometimes obscured by this other material. And if you're looking at something that's deep within this structure, like these lines, you won't be able to see them at all because of all the material, okay? So this was a problem that happened to both to standard transmission microscopy but especially it turns out to be an issue in fluorescence. So the question is, how does one deal with it? Well, let me draw this picture in a slightly different way and ask what is, what is going on with the light that comes from this sample? So I'll do it with fluorescence only because it's easier. But now what I've done here is I'm gonna increase the scale Okay, so my box is a lot bigger now. I think this can be helpful. And I ask, what happens if I have a small sample within this box? And you know that what will happen if I were to, if this were a fluorescent sample and it were to start emitting fluorescent light, Okay, um, what would happen is that the light would be leaving sort of in all directions from that object. Actually, it would be going below as well, right? Off in all directions. Well, that's okay if that's the only light in your sample to a certain extent. 
But remember all of this light that's going away from the, the main direction of the light, if you will, that's coming off to the sides is going to generate a little bit of glare by itself. You'd see that as a problem. But in addition, supposing you don't have a single object, but in fact, you have a bunch of them. This is where this diagram will become impossible because what happens is that now, regardless of sort of where they are in the sample, they're going to be sending off light as long as they get stimulated to emit fluorescence. And you're going to see a mess, to put it blunt, bluntly. Although you might be able to use a, a regular microscope to focus just on this region. So if you set your microscope so that you focus only on this one spot, then the spot will be in focus, but all the rest of it will be blurred. So you'll end up with, again, something sort of like this. You'd have this spot, but again, it will be blurred out by all the material around it. So this is the problem that people started to think about. Remarkable how long it took them to realize this was going to be a major problem, but you'll see how, how it was resolved. So the way that this was resolved was to say, look, let's try two approaches. So one of the things I can do is sort of what I suggested already. That is, instead of illuminating the entire sample, let's just illuminate it with a single spot. And let's see how I'm gonna indicate a single spot of light. Let's make it like a little cylinder. Okay, and so I illuminate with just a single spot of light. Now, if I move that spot around and ask, where does it become brighter? Here's a, here's a graph of that sort of intensity. I'm moving along, I'm moving along, and suddenly I hit that spot and it goes up and down. And then there's still some blur around it, okay? But clearly this thing is much more intense. And that's a good spot, a good place to begin. The problem is I'm still going to get some of this other material that comes off from the sides as well, okay? So what can I do? Well, what I can do optically turns out to be an interesting solution, which is it's, it's now number two on this list, which is, to say, okay, there's going to be this sort of spread of light that comes off even when it hits my, my own sample. So I'm still gonna have some light that comes off that will basically blur out some of what I've been looking at. Now, time to go into a little bit of a microscope image. Here's a lens. Is my sample, okay? Normally, if I use the wide scope, a wide illumination, this whole area would be illuminated, right? But if I'm using a spot, I'm only going to illuminate one little area. And I can say that I'm going to be getting signal that comes from that spot but it's gonna go sort of all over the place still because of the way I illuminate it, right? Now, here's the trick. How did I get a spot? Oh, I got a spot by focusing my light through a hole, through this hole. We call it a pinhole. 
Okay, so the light has come down through that pinhole. And, uh, my color codes are really going to drive everyone nuts, but okay. So I've got light coming down here through the pinhole, and I'm looking at one specific spot on my sample. Oh, I've got to go through the lens. All right. And I'm going to move it back and forth, but wherever it hits the sample, I'm getting light going out in all directions. Supposing now I send the, the, the light, the resultant light, up through that hole itself or a similar hole, turns out to be the same hole that's in exactly the same focal position. So the fact that you have one object in focus through this and the other one coming back up through the same thing is what re people refer to in the term of confocal. Which means it's in focus, both the illuminating light and the emitted light or the transmitted light are in the same focal position. You can do the same thing, as it turns out. With transmitted light, you can put a pinhole at the bottom like this and collect only that light that came directly from the middle of the sample. Okay, so the whole idea of this system is to basically eliminate as much as possible of the background light. Okay? There are a couple of ways of doing it. Um, I'll just put it into, a, give you a diagram of a microscope first to give you a sense of how you might do it. And then we'll play around with some variants. So we start with light that is coming from lasers. Turns out you need lasers because you need this light to be very bright. As you see, there's going to be a lot of lost light, okay? There's also going to be your sample down here. And so from this laser light source, Well, I've drawn it like an incandescent bulb, but it's a laser, okay? From this light source, you get light which passes, because it comes out of a laser, it's already a very fine line of light, but you actually can use an additional lens to sort of focus it down. And eventually it will go through a, um, a dichroic filter. So here's a dichroic filter. The light will go through that. Let me change it so that it doesn't confuse you more than it needs to, although it will. The light goes through the dichroic filter. And then it comes all the way down, interacts with the sample, okay? And causes, if we're looking at fluorescence, comes back up the system. and is reflected by a dichroic filter to some sort of detector system, okay? Or it goes all the way through and we pick it up with a detector that reads sort of transmitted detectors, transmitted light. In both cases, in the standard confocal microscope, these detectors, are photomultiplier tubes. And you may remember that the design of a photomultiplier is that when light interacts with it, there are several designs of it, but basically it's kind of a, a tube with a lot of plates in it. And when light hits one of the plates, it causes a shower of light or of electrons. Generally it's electrons. 
that come down, those interact with the other plates and you end up getting this real cascade or actually an avalanche of signal that comes out at the bottom of this tube. And now you have a readable electronic signal. So you could take the signal from the photomultiplier and start using it to make an image. But remember that that's from one single spot in the scan. So now what you have to do is work out a way of scanning. Okay, and it turns out it's not scanned with coils, which is what we used in the scanning EM, but it's scanned with mirrors. And what you find up here in the light path from, from this laser is a couple of mirrors, but basically it's one mirror that reflects the light in back and forth this way, and the second mirror that reflects it the other direction at different rates, so that eventually you do just what you do with the scanning microscope, which is that you scan the beam across the sample. And as the beam scans across the sample, then you're going to get a signal that varies with the scan interaction with the sample. So that what will happen is you'll start to collect information from this corner, from this corner, from here, from more, from more, from more. And once again, you build up an image of the fluorescent spot, okay? Now, what's going on in the sample then is that your beam has been focused to an extremely small spot, and you're only going to look at a small area at any one time in both the X and Y directions. So one more time to look at a three-dimensional object. You're going to be getting the scan that comes from the spot going horizontally across the sample but also because it's focused to a really small spot. It'll only go to a certain part of the depth. And you'll get an image from a particular depth in the sample. Now, you've got a machine that's doing two things so far. It's scanning, creating fluorescence, and it's focusing just on one narrow level of material in the sample. So what you could do now is not only that, you can accumulate an image in one plane. So I'm gonna draw up now, this is sort of horrible stuff. Okay, I've got an image that I've generated from the first scan, which is over here. And then I move the sample down a little bit. And I take another scan. And I can keep doing that for a large number of images or a large number of depths within the sample. And each time get a single plane within it. And then using the computer system, we can then assemble all those slices into a single, into a single machine, okay? So now the question is, how do we do this scanning? What I suggested is what goes on in the modern confocal microscope, which is that the mirrors are essentially controlled electronically and they move the beam back and forth. When the microscopes were originally formed, made, that was not very easy to do. And so what people tended to do, certainly in the early machines, 
is actually move the sample back and forth, move the stage back and forth with a mechanical controller. So we have at least those two options. You can move the beam or you can move the sample. And it then turned out that there was another approach. Let's start with this one. So it's what you would call spot scanning. And their choice is move the sample or move the beam. So as people were playing around with this, one group, a lab as it turns out in Czechoslovakia, and I'll go over it, decided to try a different approach. And that approach used what is called a scanning disk, a Nipkow disk. Well, Nipkow invented this thing in 1885, and certainly it was not considered to be very used for microscopy at that point. The idea of a Nipkow disk, and this one is the, is the disk itself, okay, is that it's a disk, let me simplify the disk now. that has a series of holes in it. And the holes basically track, if I could do this right, a spiral, a single spiral like this. So, as you irradiate this whole thing with light, then the sample will be irradiated first by this spot, then by this spot, then by this spot, then this and this, so that what you'll end up with, if your sample is now, let's say, flat on the surface here, your sample will have been hit some, by some light here, and then some light here, and then some light here, and then some light here. So that eventually what you would do is illuminate the whole sample in one sort of one swell, fell swoop, right? That if you put enough holes in this disk, that's what's drawn here, you should be able to cover the entire sample with, with that material. And so the idea here is that you illuminate again, here's a laser that's now not a single spot, but a broad illumination. And by passing through this disc, you create a lot of mini spots, if you will, that all go through at once. So it's as if instead of scanning, instead of scanning spot by spot, you can actually scan by everything all at once. It turns out that the Nipko disk was actually used originally in some very early forms of television, where the idea was you could capture uh, an image that way. It's now been refined quite a bit more, but this is the basic idea of creating a scanning image, I'm sorry, by creating a, an image through a scanned disk, which actually covers the entire sample, little dots at a time. So each one of those dots acts like a mini confocal system. All of that information is then collected back up through the same holes because that makes it confocal, remember? And then the confocal spots go through a dichroic ferret filter to eventually give you a result on a, in this case, a, uh, a CCD, basically a single sheet that picks up all of this image at once. So in a theoretical sense, rather than having to wait for a scan to go around, back and forth, all that, you set this thing spinning and you get your entire image at once. 
The difficulty is that by doing that, you lose a lot of light and you need extremely sensitive material to pick it up, extremely sensitive cameras. Those are now available. And so this type of microscope is becoming increasingly popular. This is actually a sequence of images that I took many years ago, and they've now mounted them. They've put them on the, um, on the website for an image processing program for ImageJ. What I did was I, I made a kind of a, a movie of on the left-hand side, you'll be able to see this series of images as I go through a stack of images. So here's what we get first. Focusing through. I'm gonna stop for a second so that you can see what we're looking at is a cell with a nucleus. The nucleus has a couple of dark spots in it. Those are probably nucleoli. And here we see um, mitochondria that are being visualized in the sections, okay? Let me go back to the beginning of this and we'll do it again. So you see we're sort of slicing the mitochondria and slicing the nucleus going all the way through. And then back out the other side. Okay, now using the, ma <laughs> the magic, using the magic of uh, image processing, what's possible is to take those sections and more or less stack them on top of each other and electronically shift their position so it looks like the sample is actually rotating in space. So let's see what happens here. So we've created a kind of a three-dimensional model based on a series of slices of that tissue. There were uh, 25 separate slices that were captured by the microscope. And so you can see that although the resolution in this particular set, because it's fairly old, is still on the murky side, you can see that the principle is that you should be able to actually see a pretty good three-dimensional object with that. So that's the background for the history part of this course. So we're gonna start talking about some interesting bits of history. The first thing is the one that's almost out of, it's almost out orthogonal, except that it turns out that Marvin Minsky did patent his design for the for a confocal microscope. 1957 is when he patented it. He had the idea of making it then. And in fact, he built this machine in his lab. I'll show you a little bit of it, I think. But it's basically designed more or less the way I suggested. But I want to sort of point out what he's really known for. And Marvin Minsky it was basically the founder at MIT of the whole field of artificial intelligence, of trying to train computers to learn. And he got involved in robotics, and he got involved in trying to figure out how you could use what you know about computer knowledge to see if you can end up with some sort of model for thinking for the mind. So he's an extraordinary man in a lot of ways. And there's a wonderful essay he wrote, which I'll post for you to read, in which he talks about how he had this idea that because he was interested in the brain, he wanted to see if he could get images that would be less blurred, less confused. And so, he thought about the same issue that I just described of the confusion caused by extra material, 
And so he thought the thing to do is make a spot. And to get the spot to be go through the sample in some way, and then collect the information that he had. Now, this is in 1955. There was a lot of equipment that he didn't have. And what he ended up doing, a lot of the equipment that we today would have very easily. Uh, so what he did was he set up his microscope, basically, this is really gonna be awful, okay? With a light source here, and the light was an arc light or one of these very bright lights that one could get. He focused it with a lens through a pinhole. So he ended up with a narrow beam of light coming through. He had his sample over sitting on the stage over here. And then he had a pinhole at exactly the same focal position. So he had an extra lens here and another pinhole. And then something like a photomultiplier tube, something to pick up the signal. Okay. So if the light was spread out, remember it spreads out a little bit from the sample brought back to this focus. But again, you only let the stuff from the middle come through. Then how do you see it? Well, what he had was an old cathode ray tube that he said was war surplus. And it was just this big old thing that where you'd get a line that appeared. And in the design, you'd keep getting more lines through. And by the time you got to the bottom, the lines on top would fade. But you had enough time to see an image. Wait a minute, how did you get the beam to move? How did you get this, this scanning to occur? Well, it turns out that what he did was he scanned by moving the stage. So he had motors moving the stage back and forth and front to back, okay? And so that was the design. He claims that he had some images from this, but he never published any. In fact, he didn't do anything about it except to own the patent, which he drew, in, as I said, in 1957. But he never really had an image to talk about from it. Nevertheless, he is given credit as the person who founded the structure of a confocal microscope. His analysis of this, and as you know, I, I tend to think about this. This is the introduction to a paper by him uh, in which he finally came back to it. And here's the point. He invented this microscope similar to the one that was really done more by other people, people at Yale, people at Oxford, people uh, in Amsterdam and people who were working on this were aware of this patent. But very few people understood the value of it, okay? So it's an interesting example of something that, that sat as a concept for quite a while until people started to work with it some more. This is, I don't expect you to read this, except this is the letter that he wrote to his lawyer about the description of the patent and how this operation works. The, what I will post on the notes is Minsky's actual memory of, sorry, his memoir of this, which he wrote in 1988, 30 years later, and when he was finally urged by one of the people who was involved in, in microscope development to really write this thing out. It's a wonderful discussion of how he set this thing up. Other people later on started trying to draw some way of coming to the same idea of reflected light, in this case, a reflected light system, 
And this was a lab group uh, in Czechoslovakia initially, working with some people at Yale. But the basic design of the microscope was like this. Here's the light source. And from this light source, the light would come down through here, be reflected down to the sample, which was down below. The light would come back up, be reflected here. And again, there's some optical jumping around that went through here and eventually through the eyepiece. But between the sample was right over here is a NIPCO disc, okay, which he called a NIPCO wheel or a scanning disc, which was spinning so that the light that came down to a specific spot on the sample would then generate a corresponding signal up in the eyepiece, okay? And this is sort of the detail in the, in the wheel. Um, his images, which were are published, are not that impressive. But the idea that he was able to set this thing up is really quite, quite dramatic. Once again, notice the timing of this. This is a good 12 years after Minsky had developed his system. Okay. Anyway, what, what uh, Petron has said is this in the middle of this paper where he says here, the design, fabrication, and alignment of the disk was the most difficult and painstaking aspects of the construction of the microscope. And it sort of ends up implying that that microscope was pretty hard to make. And in fact, they didn't start making scanning type microscopes, sorry, disks type microscopes until quite late in this history. I mean, you started to see them emerging only in sort of the 1990s or so. But he had set up the idea that the reason it's called tandem was the idea that you get the signal from here merged with the view of it over here because this disc would bring one of these circles all the way around by the time you looked at it. It was very, very interesting system. Okay, but it didn't go too far. Then a couple of other labs started building more of what we might think of as conventional confocal microscopes, except they're still, in fact, moving the stage. which meant that you certainly had a limitation. And what this, by the way, this long name of R.W. Venant von Ressant, uh, Venant is also a sort of a middle name. So people sometimes call him R.W.W. Ressant and Ressant is his last name when you look this thing up. Not only does he show you a series in which you see this, what's called a through focal series. So you see this part of the cell, then you see this one, and then you see this one. He also takes the same thing and assembles a sort of a side view that you can see over here. So this is that same cell seen basically from the side optically. So this was published in, um, 1984. And then another set of people, this is the group in Holland, put together another model. There's an interesting story, which is that they wrote this thing up showing that they could do this set of, as you see them here, multiple layers, okay, um, through a system in which, let's see if we can show how it works. Here's the laser. So there's a pinhole here for illumination. And then 
The sample in this case is up here on the microscope. But once again, the idea is that you have one lens to focus this illumination pinhole on the sample. And then it goes to the stage using a moving stage again. So this is fixed. And then the light that's released is focused back down to a pinhole and a detector over here, okay? The story is that they sent this paper to Nature with a different title, with a title that says, we've just been able to make an extraordinary instrument that can do three-dimensional imaging. And Nature rejected the paper. <clears throat> Apparently Nature said, we don't do techniques. All we're going to publish is serious results. So they took the exact same paper and changed the title to three-dimensional chromatin distribution shown by confocal scanning microscopy. Kind of an amazing little story in this. So this is coming out in 1985. And at about the same time, there was a group at, uh, in England at the medical in Cambridge, UK, putting together their own, but this is the first one in which they've worked out a way of actually swinging the light beam back and forth through the system, okay? And in their paper, they show this, they show this extraordinary collection of images in which you can see them focusing, this is with standard bright field or standard fluorescence imaging over here. this group, and then the set at the bottom here is using their confocal image and stained with a tubulin antibody. So that allowed them to look at the network of microtubules within the cells. Now, there's another side issue that comes about with this question about the instrument being available at the time it was sort of that the rest of things were necessary so that everything co uh, coordinated very well. So here we have a group of people internationally starting in 1955 with this idea. And even a little bit later using the uh, NIPCAO disc as another way of doing the same sort of thing. And then a group of people focusing more or less at the same time in the 1980s in different countries, being in touch with each other, but nevertheless thinking about different approaches to using it. Well, what happened between say 1960s and the 1980s was the development of fluorescence and not only of fluorescence, but of immunofluorescence. And there is an interesting thought in there that one of the interesting phenomena was that people thought that antibodies were really only useful for disease, that, that antibodies wouldn't bind to normal cellular components because the sense was that the immune system would be tolerant to anything that was really found within the cell itself. And then it was shown that there were ways of tricking the immune system so that you could get antibodies to all of the internal components, to tubulin, to actin, to mitochondrial proteins, to nuclear proteins. All of that material started to emerge in the 1980s. And so suddenly there was a need for fluorescence microscopy and not only just a fluorescence microscopy, but a fluorescence microscopy of a real fine uh, resolution of high quality. And suddenly then there was this demand, this need for confocal microscopes. According to White, who published this set of pictures in the Journal of Cell Biology, apparently it was, according to him, it was reviewed, you know, as papers generally are. And 
one of the reviewers just called him up and said, can I buy one? Without even, before it even got published, was ready to pick up this thing. Didn't care how much, just wanted to get one because he could see the potential value of this instrument. And now, as you know, there are, you know, as I said, you can find confocal microscopes in virtually all laboratories. And so just to sort of point out something that I find rather interesting is that if you look at the major manufacturers of confocal microscopes, they're Leica and Zeiss, both of these are German companies. Olympus and Nikon are both uh, Japanese companies. And there seems to be no American company that's competing in this market. The optical experience of both Leica and Zeiss and of Olympus and Nikon is such that it would be very hard to catch up and keep going in that area. I think that's it for today.